From the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, this is Nebraska Farmcast. I'm Ryan Evans, and on this episode, I'm looking forward to exploring how federal policy shapes the market for biofuels, a critical aspect that impacts farmers here in Nebraska and nationwide. Nebraska Extension Policy Specialist Dr. Brad Lubin's latest policy report column for Nebraska Farmer Magazine dives into how U.S. policy drives the development of the renewable fuels market and how the increased use of products like renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel might help to propel the ag economy. He joins me now. Brad, thanks for being here again. Good to be with you. So we know there are several recent policy discussions, but how have federal policy decisions, uh, both those in in the last 20 plus years, influenced the trajectory of the biofuels market in the U.S.? That's right. There seem to be policy issues ongoing almost at all times, but they really do date back decades. Uh, The biofuels market, the biofuels production process also, frankly, dates back a century or more in terms of initial efforts to understand how to convert uh, agricultural feedstocks into biofuels. But here in the late 19th, late 20th century, uh, we had substantial investments uh, in uh, biofuel generation, um, particularly driven by tax credits and other, uh, other policies. In 2005 and again in 2007, we added in a renewable fuels mandate uh, that effectively mandated a minimum level of production and, and utilization uh, that helped to spur uh, the, the most recent uh, growth phase of the biofuel sector here in the U.S. So how do you see the markets for renewable diesel and sustainable aviation mm-hmm. fuel, two specific products we mentioned, and uh, how those markets are evolving and what policy developments might be crucial yeah. for their growth? Well, the evolution of renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel are really sort of the two newest chapters in where biofuel uh, demand might come from. The the mandates that were passed back in 2005 and 2007 really matured in 2022, leaving EPA the annual responsibility to set mandates for biofuel usage for our more traditional conventional biofuels like corn-based ethanol, as well as some of our advanced biofuels, including biodiesel. But those markets are also uh, somewhat maturing or at least Uh, maturing in the sense of having a policy driver uh, behind them. Uh, And particularly in the case of of, uh, conventional ethanol and and motor vehicle fuel usage, there's some thought too that the statistics point to a maturing motor vehicle fuel market. And so fighting over market share of a market that itself might be topping out uh, with increased efficiency, with an electric vehicle fleet growing, um, the possibility that uh, the, the traditional market is is maturing and even uh, perhaps waning, really points to agriculture looking at, hey, renewable diesel and uh, sustainable aviation fuel offer two new very possible growth opportunities to drive that next, uh, the next spurt, that next generation, uh, that next wave of, of biofuel growth. And so the debate over ethanol usage continues and the push for E15 approval continues to be a focal point in that debate. So what are some of the key challenges that are maybe hindering broader acceptance of higher ethanol blends? You know, the E15 debate is really sort of a continuation of the E10 debate that we had a few years ago and just the overall uh, discussion of higher blends of of biofuels in in the fuel vehicle mix. That same debate over the future of motor vehicle fuel demand uh, and the idea if, if demand is topping out uh, and that means the market share is maturing or even waning, or excuse me, the total market's maturing or waning, then the fight over market share is, is substantial. And what was argued as a blend wall at E10 uh, years ago uh, is suddenly, well, it's not a blend wall if we can actually incorporate higher blends, uh, but now the fight's over E15. And E15 would at least push out that perceived wall uh, uh, another 50%. Uh, and help. Well, E15 has now finally been approved for year-round usage, but not until next year. So we still had to come up with a stopgap measure this year uh, for summer acceptance. Uh, E10, E15, or even E85, the the move to a much higher blend, is a fundamental fight over market share in a traditional motor vehicle fuel market. And that's going to be a challenge for producers. That's where some of the impetus really came from, or at least one argument would be, that's where the interest comes for renewable diesel and same aviation fuel as if there's a growth sector left, that might be the biggest growth sector uh, growth opportunity. 
on the way there, lowering emissions across the biofuel production process is going to involve uh, various strategies from feedstock production through processing. So what are some effective practices farmers and producers can adopt or what is policy yeah. saying about this um, as far as reducing the carbon footprint through the production process? Right. The, the challenge here with biofuels is that it's still a market fundamentally driven by policy, <clears throat> whether it's renewable uh, diesel market uh, driven by mandates, usage mandates, uh, clean air mandates in California and uh, uh, accompanying uh, mandates in Washington and Oregon, uh, or whether it's the role for both renewable diesel or ethanol to have a pathway to sustainable aviation fuel. It's fundamentally driven by whether the emissions reductions um, can be met to qualify as a sustainable fuel, and if they can, how far those emissions can go in order to qualify for higher and higher levels of tax credits. So it's still a tax credit driven uh, demand uh, and a and a emissions uh, reduction uh, requirement to get there uh, and to benefit from from the incentive. Well, consider ethanol and its pathway to sustainable aviation fuel. It has to reduce emissions uh, and it has to to qualify and, and be competitive in that market. The three largest sources of emissions in the entire sort of life cycle of ethanol to sustainable aviation fuel come from the agricultural production phase, the feedstock production phase, the processing phase of converting uh, ag feedstocks into ethanol, and then something called the indirect land use calculation, which really seemingly is this black box calculation of, we know an increase in demand here drives increases in land use elsewhere, and that has uh, emissions uh, attached to it. But all three of those can be dissected a bit further, and it gets just uh, fuzzier and fuzzier. At the production phase, um, various ag practices may be shown to reduce emissions in the production phase, and you can <clears throat> track or measure that level of emissions. But we may not have enough precision to measure those things at the, at the current time. And in fact, the government released its um, current what they call um, safeguard or, or uh, um, safe harbor provisions under their uh, sustainable aviation fuel requirements. And that is <clears throat> to tell producers, for corn producers, adopt um, cover crops, conservation tillage, and nutrient management, nitrogen management specifically. Uh, on the soybean side, it's cover crops and conservation tillage. Well, we don't have an exact measure of what those practices would would contribute. We don't have a measure of exactly how much they need to contribute in order for it to qualify. But in the absence of those, we have a safe harbor provision in the current rule that says, if you do these things, we will continue to see more pressure, more practices, more efforts to measure those practices and assess what the real uh, emissions and emissions reductions can be. That's the production phase policy driven because you've got to figure out what those practices are and how much they reduce and what might be required. You have the, the actual biofuel production process, the processing stage. And here we have the reality that look for every gallon of biofuels we have, we have a fairly fixed uh, constant here of how much carbon dioxide we're also going to produce in the ethanol process. It's, roughly approximately a third ethanol, a third carbon dioxide, and a third distiller's grains. Well, that carbon dioxide either gets released out the smokestack or it gets captured. And how do you capture it? Well, you have to not only capture it, you have to have a place to store it. That storage might mean that we have to have a pipeline that moves it from the processing facility to the storage facility. The pipeline, as we know, is its own policy debate and uh, sort of contentious issue. And so what we do on every phase here matters, and the policy decisions that happen in every phase also matter. And then I mentioned the, the indirect land use calculation is something of a black box. Well, the U.S. government has established uh, the use of what they call the GREET model, G-E-R-E-E-T is the acronym, uh, for a, uh, a model of emissions and emissions reductions. That GREET model makes a certain assumption about indirect land use that at least was more favorable to ag biofuels than a rival model, a Corsia model, uh, that is 
generally used internationally by the aviation uh, sector. And so the U.S. calculation has a smaller indirect land use assumption or calculation in there as compared to the Corsia model, but we're still fundamentally quite... Uh, uh, it, it's worth looking at that number wherever it comes from and, and having quite a bit of wonder about whether uh, whether it really is, is accurate and, and whether it uh, uh, attempts to measure what really happens. As an example, if I can back up a few years here, when California established uh, um, uh, pollution standards that meant that biofuels had to reduce emissions in order to qualify for the California uh, fuel market, there was a time, or at least a point, where California rules favored um, uh, sugarcane-based ethanol from Brazil as more environmentally friendly than corn-based ethanol from the Midwestern United States. Based on calculations of production, based on calculations of emissions in the production and processing stage and transportation stage, so forth, uh, California rules had determined that Midwestern corn-based ethanol was less friendly to the environment, a bigger indirect land use calculation because corn acres here translated into new uh, uh, forest acres cut down elsewhere, whereas sugarcane acres were already in sugarcane. Okay. The result of that policy was that there was Brazilian ethanol on a ship from Brazil to California. At the same time, there was U.S. corn-based ethanol on a ship from the U.S. to Brazil to make up for the ethanol that was shipped out of the Brazilian market. So uh, the, whatever calculation you think is appropriate for indirect land use, the calculation ended up creating a situation where there were literally two ships passing in the night, <laughs> both loaded with ethanol, headed the opposite directions, and both producing their own emissions that added to uh, the ultimate footprint here for biofuels. Uh, the policy doesn't guarantee that the market works uh, in a sensible fashion, but the policy definitely drives what happens in the marketplace. So what are you watching then in going forward in this? There's all sorts of debates at play here. As we mentioned, uh, ethanol's position in the uh, fuel market. You've got a potential pipeline, uh, pipelines maybe that are going to be mm -hmm. needed to be constructed. It's mm -hmm. always debate over that, as you mentioned, debate over policy continues. So where's the resolution? You know, we are really in a... Uh, um we're really uh, at, a, at a cutting edge level here of trying to figure out what the next steps really are. Uh, the ag market has, has responded and sees great opportunity here for uh, both ethanol and renewable diesel um, opportunities here. Um, the policy drivers, however, uh, leave a great deal of uncertainty. Um, think of the same aviation fuel market. The current tax credit rules only that were just released by the government only apply to this fiscal year. The next fiscal year needs new tax credit rules for that section of, of policy. Uh, and so there's debate about, well, we don't even have a, a, a forward-looking uh, set of requirements yet, except to say that we just released a certain set of rules and that's at least provide a framework for what the next set of rules might look like. Um, at the production phase, we're going to continually study practices and their impact on emissions and the life cycle uh, emissions of uh, biofuel feedstock production. But we're also going to look at efficiencies at the processing stage and transportation. And we're going to fundamentally at some point have to figure out what the indirect land use calculation really is and what it, uh, what it uh, appropriately should be for competing biofuels. You can check out Dr. Brad Lubin's article in the uh, June issue of Nebraska Farmer Magazine. We also link to it on our Center for Ag Profitability's website at cap.unl.edu, which will take you to that full article via Nebraska Farmer. Brad, thanks so much. Good to be with you. Nebraska Farmcast is a production of the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. For the latest research-based information and education resources to manage your farm or ranch operation, visit our website at cap.unl.edu. That's cap.unl.edu.